Today we're going to talk about estrogen in relationship to the female cycle, something that's extremely common yet very misunderstood. So let's just break it down. First of all, let's talk about what a hormone is. Hormones are communications that are created and sent through the blood system. So they're created by the gland, sent through the blood, and they connect into a part of the tissue that has receptors for that specific hormone. Like right now, I'm talking to you through the computer, into your speaker, into your ear, and you're receiving that information. If I was speaking another language, that would be like a different hormone. So the receiver has to understand the language for what it's being received by. So estrogen has receptors in the liver, in the uterus, in the bone, in the brain, in the, in the ovary. So it can even go from ovary to ovary as well. So basically we have the glands and glands, the difference between a gland and an organ is glands make hormones. Organs don't with the exception of the liver. The liver does make a hormone. So, but typically glands make hormones sent through the blood and get received over here to create some effect. So hormones are communications. The one we're going to talk about today is estrogen. Every month, one of your ovaries runs the show and sends the hormones into the, into the bud, blood on a 28-day uh, cycle. So at day 14, you have this spike of estrogen, and then it goes down, and this is ovulation, when you're the most fertile. And then another hormone that the ovary produces called progesterone increases as well, and then at day 28, that's when you have the menstrual cycle, and then this thing starts over and over and over again. So based on when you have the problem during the 28-day cycle, we can kind of tell where, the, uh, where your issue is because a lot of women a week before their period start getting like, they feel like they're pregnant and they're just like all this fluid retention, their belly sticks out. Well, we know that's progesterone versus estrogen. If the problem is during ovulation, then we know it's definitely estrogen. If it's during your cycle, we know it's estrogen. So the effects that estrogen create in the cell, whether it's the liver, the uterus, or wherever, um, or the breast tissue, can create, um, affect the breast, the size of the breast. Uh, that's why if there's a problem with estrogen, you can have tenderness in the breast or cysts in the breast. The uterus, uh, the menstrual cycle, uh, your sex drive, the DNA. So estrogen affects the DNA, the transcription of the, of the blueprints. So Estrogen can um, send a message into the DNA and, and tell parts of your body to grow and get bigger. All right? So that's why it affects the DNA. And that's why it can create tumors. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, estrogen affects the shape of your body. It, it feminizes the body. And that's why it gives the, the lower part, the hips, um, a shape. It gives the curve on a female body. That's why women have a layer of fat superficial fat that men don't have in the lower part of their bodies. Well, some men do, but most don't. So it gives you the shape. And so if there's too much estrogen, you're going to get too much heavy lower part of your body. Um, the bone, it affects the bone. It affects the cognitive, the brain. It affects the electrolytes in the kidneys, the potassium sodium ratio. So you can see it has many, many different effects. But the function of the ovary is to send hormones into different parts and then one month the one of the ovaries will do do all the work and then the other month the other ovary does the all the um, produces the ovulation so they alternate back and forth between left and right ovary so depending on what part of your body you have low back pain on it could be like the right lower part of the back and the next week it's like no pain and then it could be the right side then we know the right ovary could be producing too much estrogen so they alternate or even sometimes you'll get acne on the one side of your face versus the other side. So again, the ovary produces these hormones that create all sorts of different effects in the body. Now probably the most common problem with the ovary is the overproduction of estrogen. They call it estrogen dominance. It's too much estrogen. Um, what happens with too much estrogen, you're going to get excessively heavy periods, cramping, no periods, irregular periods, irregular cycles, uh, long periods, heavy bleeding. Every single problem with that period will be disrupted with too much estrogen. And one of the, one of the triggers 
for too much estrogen, we'll get into the next part, but it could be uh, low progesterone because if the estrogen causes no periods, there's nothing to trigger the progesterone release. And so therefore the progesterone goes down even more and then the relative ratio of estrogen goes up like a teeter-totter. So estrogen and progesterone work like this. So when you don't have much of this, this kind of goes up in the relative ratios, just like salt and potassium. So if you have too much salt, your potassium is going to go down. Same effect. So estrogen can cause no periods, and then there's no progesterone, and then that makes more estrogen. So it's kind of a, an interesting thing. Okay, headaches come from too much estrogen. Fluid retention can come from estrogen dominance. Fibroids, endometriosis, which is extra growth of, of tissue in the female cavity through here, can come from estrogen dominance as well. And um, because, remember, we talked about DNA. DNA, it affects the blueprints. It makes tissue grow. It increases the size of different things. So fibroids definitely come from estrogen dominance. Cysts come from estrogen dominance. And you can have cysts on the ovaries. You can have it on the breast. Um, and that, could, that comes from estrogen dominance as well. Gallstones. Why? Because estrogen concentrates the cholesterol in the gallbladder, thereby creating stones. So gallstones are a real common trigger from high levels of estrogen, and you usually see them after pregnancy simply because of the spike of estrogen during the cycle in the, in the pregnancy. Okay, then we have cancer. Too much estrogen can trigger cancer. And that's why one of the medications they use as an anti-cancer blocker would be tamoxifen, which blocks the receptors for estrogen, decreasing the risks. So cancer is definitely triggered by too much estrogen. And then the thyroid can be diminished with too much estrogen. Why? Because the thyroid also has receptors for, I'll try to draw a little tiny picture here, receptors for estrogen. So if there's too much thyroid, uh, estrogen in the body, it can block the receptors in the thyroid and now not let the thyroid hormones get in there, thereby decreasing the function of the thyroid. So we have a secondary low thyroid called hypothyroid coming from an estrogen dominant situation. And that's why you see a lot of women with thyroid problems after pregnancy, after being exposed to a lot of estrogen. So I would, this is my guess, I would say most thyroid cases are this problem right here, not primary. So those are some of the effects that estrogen dominance can create on the body. So the next question is what causes estrogen dominance? Well, the first thing is our environmental. First of all, we are in an environment that's so bathed with so much estrogen that, I mean, it's everywhere. It's in the pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, heavy metals, country and western. No, it's a bad joke. And then you have DDT. Now, DDT was banned in 1971, yet we're finding it in, in our adipose tissue, our fat tissue, even in kids. Why? Because we're not able to use it in the U.S., but we're able to sell it to third world countries where we buy our fruits and vegetables in the, in the winter. So it comes right back and goes right into our body. DDT mimics estrogen. So environmentally, they call it endocrine disruptors, which are really chemicals in the environment that mimic estrogen. And our cells can receive or pick up, the tissues can receive these chemicals and they can act like estrogen. And that's why a lot of the books on toxicology, the study of poisons, show the relationship between these chemicals, pesticides and things, and hormone disruption. So we have that, number one. Um, HRT, hormone replacement therapy, used to be called estrogen replacement therapy, but they found estrogen causes cancer. So what they did is they added a little bit of progesterone to buffer it, which did decrease the cancer risk by some amount, and then they call it hormone replacement therapy. But these estrogens that are synthetic, which are by, um, made from horse urine, uh, pregnant horses, are a lot different than our bodies. Our bodies as humans were not designed to be exposed to horse estrogens. Um, so it does create a lot of problems for females when they have to take HRT. And then birth control pills, estrogen. The next one is soy, specifically soy protein isolates. 
95% of soy protein isolates are genetically modified. But they're putting the, this type of protein, it's kind of a new protein, in the, in the breakfast cereals, in the baby food, in the uh, protein bars, in the diet shakes. Um, a lot of these diets use the soy protein isolates because it's a cheap type of protein. Uh, Dr. McDougall, MD, has found that soy protein isolates can influence fibroids and tumors in the liver. Okay, progesterone decreases. We talked about that in the last section. Really, when you start losing your period around um, premenopause or perimenopause, I'm sorry, you can then have a problem with decreased progesterone and relative increased estrogen because they work on a reciprocal basis. So that can also be one of the problems that we're dealing with. And so we also have liver problems. Now, the liver is where you actually detoxify estrogen, too much of it. So if that liver is healthy, you can get rid of a lot of this extra estrogen. But if you're starting to get constipation and gallbladder problems and liver toxicity because your diet's really crappy, you're not going to be able to break down this excess estrogen. And that could be another culprit to estrogen dominance. So these are some of the common causes of estrogen dominance. So I want to make one point about menopause. I have a lot of clients that tell me, well, I'm running out of estrogen because I'm going through menopause, so therefore I need to take estrogen in the thoughts that if they don't, they're going to end up with Alzheimer's, osteoporosis, and get really old and heart disease. In fact, there's very little research of that. I would love to find some research. So the next time someone tells you that, ask for the research. It's not really there. See, you have a backup organ. During menopause, the adrenal glands on top of your kidney produce the same uh, hormones as the ovaries do. Not in the same quantity, but the same hormones. So what's supposed to happen naturally in nature is the ovaries shut down or they stop working, and then all this work is done on the adrenals. What we're seeing is this. People going into menopause with burnt out adrenals, <laughs> Everything, they're not able to back up those ovaries effectively, and then they end up with all these problems with hot flashes, night sweats, and vaginal dryness, and a lot of weight gain because now the adrenals have to work harder and they get this bigger stomach and belly fat. So really, if there's a problem with adrenals before menopause, it's exaggerated after menopause. Okay, so they go from one problem to a worse problem. And then people take what's called, they start taking hormones, and the problem is side effects to that. And even the bioidentical hormones, here's the problem I have with taking bioidentical hormones. Remember we talked about the gland that makes hormones. Hormones are the communications. The gland is the thing that makes the hormones, and it's sent over here to something else. Instead of focusing on the hormone, where basically the problem is not really the hormone, it's the gland. Very few people support the thing that makes the hormone. Because when you take even bioidentical hormones, you actually inactivate your own gland that makes that hormone. Same thing with the thyroid. When you're taking thyroid medication or thyroid hormones, your gland doesn't have to produce so it goes to sleep over time. You shrivel it up. So that's why I'm not crazy about people jumping and start taking hormones because you're going to then shut down your own body's ability to make it. What you should do is take a look at how you can support the gland. Okay, we'll get to that in the next section. Okay, so now what do we do about this? There are four solutions that I, I recommend. Phytoestrogens, that, that would be all those vegetables that uh, people never eat, like the cruciferous vegetables, kale, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage. Those foods are anti-estrogenic, which means they help balance your estrogens. They're not going to decrease the good estrogens. They're going to balance any bad, and they protect against cancer. Um, so, and, and again, as far as the solution, um, this is my disclaimer. I'm not telling you that any of these will help you with any diseases, uh, will prevent any diseases. Uh, I'm not telling you these are going to treat a disease. So check with your doctor with that. That's my disclaimer, okay? These are just things that can help support a healthy menstrual cycle, okay? All right, so we got phytoestrogens. Um, very few people have enough of those. I highly recommend start eating those. That's why the kale shake is so important. If you have not done the kale shake, go to drbird.com, the front page, and scroll down and download that eating plan because it's a, it shows you how to make the kale shakes every morning. It's a no-brainer. Everyone should be on that kale shake. Avoid estrogens. Well, here's the thing. Um, 
I'm not telling you to come off your medication, check with your doctor, but start avoiding estrogens in the, uh, in the food supply. You have hormones in all the butter, the cheese, the milk, the dairy, the beef, the chicken, the turkey. So have foods that are hormone free, all right? Because there's estrogen in those foods. Also, have more organic vegetables. Now, if you cannot afford it, at least don't buy the ones from Chile and Mexico. Buy vegetables that are in the country. That way you don't get the DDT, all right? Because you don't know if there's DDT on there or not. It's just a big mystery. Um, so we want to avoid estrogens. We want to support the gland. So um, I created something that I've been using in my clinic to support a healthy ovary and uterus because it supports both. And I don't know if you can see it that far, but it's called ovary uh, support formula. And this is what I recommend for clients just to help balance things and improve things overall and then mate and for a maintenance as well. So I recommend three of these and they uh, are a nutritional blend that supports not just the ovaries but the, but the uterus as well. And it doesn't have estrogen. It, it has nutrients that that target the gland itself. Okay, so we want to support the gland. Um, and then we want to eat foods that support the liver. And that's why in my book, The Seven Principles of Fat Burning, I talk the first eating plan that everyone does is the liver enhancement. Why? Because that way we can support the liver. The liver can then balance any excess of estrogen that shouldn't be there. Um, so the foods that support the liver also support estrogen because there are certain things in the liver that regulate estrogen or buffer excessive toxic amounts of estrogen. So those are four very simple things you should focus on to help your situation and your cycle.